Okay, so um, we're going to keep on working on the uh, on motion. Um, so I was just doing two things. I was extending the deadline for the HAR3 because it's, not, it's a few people were struggling to Friday. Uh, anyway, probably most of you already have submitted, so that's fine. Um, the <laughs> and I was just checking the videos because they're, they're, they're using old codec that nobody uses anymore, so it had to be done. All right, so uh, we're going to want to use now motion estimation. Okay, so we looked um, at um, a very um, simplistic view of what motion estimation is, and I'm trying to see what we can do with it. Uh, so this kind of little graphs um, were really uh, used by Professor Anya Kokoram, and they're very confusing at the beginning, but very clear at the end. Um, so the vertical. The vertical lines here, they correspond to um, a frame that you sit from the side. Okay, so imagine that's your y-axis, and so you sit from the from the side. So you don't really see the plane; you just see the the side of the the picture. Okay, makes sense. So you don't see the x coordinate; you just see the the y coordinates. All right. So you have one, two, three, four, five frames, and you see them from the, from, the, from the side. So in this scene, you have um, an object. So that's the, uh, the pink, purplish um, object here. And that object will move in time. Okay? In fact, you can look at the arrow uh, of the corresponding uh, motion estimation, or the, actually true motion in this case. The background, which is just a black line, is actually static, so there's no motion, and so each pixel here is mapped to the same location in the, um, in the previous frame. All right, so when you do, there's two types of processing you can do, so the non-motion composited processing. Um, by non motion compensated, we mean that we don't, we just, we don't do motion estimation. And when we compare images, when we do processing, we just assume that a pixel location, the object you have corresponds to the same position in the previous frame, or at least you don't try to look around, you just you know, look at, at, this, at a particular pixel location in time. When you do use motion composited processing, what you do is you're trying to say, I was here at time t, so when I looked at time t minus 1, I should really have an offset uh, which is given by the motion vector you've estimated. All right, so pretty simple approach. Um, and so we're going to use that for the first thing we're going to do is for denoising. Okay. So hopefully that will somehow work here. Um, all right, so you have a very simple video, so just the picture from Lena and with noise, uh, uh, Gaussian white noise, because the, the, the noise changes. It's just randomly sampled at every single pixel, uh, you know, generate a new uh, noise sample, and that is um, you know, not correlated. It's independent in time and space. Right? So it looks quite noisy. So let's look at a few um, non motion composited algorithms we could try to do for denoising. Okay? So we know that the noise process is as follows. So you have the degraded picture is the original picture plus some noise process here. All right, so remember this um, bold X, that's the, uh, it's a vector of the uh, pixel coordinates X, Y. And so I, N, so N is a frame number, and I usually refers here to the uh, intensity or to the, to the picture, uh, uh, the value uh, at that particular pixel. So we say the degraded version is just, you know, uh, the original picture plus some noise. Um, so, you know, one thing we can do is to use um, <clears throat> a, um, what's called a, a moving average, uh, which is basically we, um, actually like here in this case, that's the actual average, but, um, we just take, say that the reconstructed frame N is uh, a mixture of the previously reconstructed frame and 
uh, the current noisy observation we have. Okay, so we say we try to take uh, an average uh, over all the frames uh, of um, of your images. Uh, so this is how it works. So the first frame, you just take the noisy image. Second frame, you have uh, half of the reconstructed one, uh, uh, original, and the current one. So that's basically just the average. And you keep on going. And all what I have written here is just a way of saying a long time when you look at frame n, you kind of have a recursive way of computing the average of the uh, previous n frames. Um, and this is what it looks like. So the, the first frame would be um, not denoised. That would just be the original. And then the second frame would be uh, slightly less noisy. And, and as you go along, um, this would be the tense denoised frame. And then you can see it looks pretty good. Right? So it makes sense. You just average uh, 10 instances of your, the same pixel, but with different um, uh, variations in the noise. So therefore, the, the mean of the noise is 0. So you, you converge to the original picture, and that's all fine. So that's what you get. So that's the um, original noisy video. And that's the uh, denoise process. And very quickly, you converge to um, a very clean picture. Now, of course, when you apply that in real life, um, see, I'm unconvinced that this video is actually the noisy video. Um, let's ignore the. In theory, that should be the noisy video, but I'm, yeah, I'm not too sure. Uh, anyway, on the right is the effect you get. And it's not noisy at all, but it's, it's not good, right? Uh, that's because, of course, we didn't account for motion, right? So uh, without going to um, look at, um, at motion estimation, there's a number of tricks you can do, OK? So the first thing is. Uh, instead of computing the actual average over the first n frames, you could have this uh, basically uh, one tap IIR filter uh, where you take you know, 0 0.8 of the previous reconstructed image uh, plus 0 0.2 of the current frame. So that should be a hat, really. Um, and in that case, what you do is you, you update a bit your, what your estimate of the current frame is. Okay, so it's a it's a low pass filter, uh, IR low pass filter. Um, so you kind of you know average in time, but only over some kind of uh, period of time, right? And so you can see you don't have this. The blur doesn't extend to the beginning of the video, but it still looks quite blurry when you have um, when you have motion. Okay, so everywhere you have motion, which is almost everywhere here, um, you still see uh, you know blur in that direction. We can go a bit further. Um, so what you can do here is you can say, right, so we have this moving average. Uh, so the moving average is just, that's the other definition for it. We have this, it's called the uh, forgetting factor alpha. So basically, if alpha is higher, then you forget what you've done in the past. Okay. So if alpha is 1, that you only say that the reconstructed picture is your uh, observed image. Uh, so what you could say is we could tune that dynamically. And you can say, let's look at the difference between the uh, estimated frame, denoised frame, because that's kind of what it is. That's the estimate of the deno denoised image we have with the uh, current observation. Uh, do um, frame difference on that. So it's, it's a bit like your in your lab you've done this week, it's, there is the, a threshold you test whether there is motion or not. Okay, So that's kind of the first step. You see, you know, do I observe a difference or not? And if there is no difference, then maybe you shouldn't do anything. So here we check whether we observe motion by looking at the, the frame difference between our estimate and the current frame. There is this little function here, but the, 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 the little function here is just to make that go smoothly so you don't, don't have just a threshold you know, that would be visible. Uh, so you have something going smoothly from 0 0.2 to 1. Okay. All right, so this is what you get now uh, with that principle. Um, so it's starting to look kind of OK. 
um, less, I mean, the, 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 the artifacts are not that bad, okay? So, um, so by, by tuning that parameter, you know, if, um, think about that, okay, if you're in a white pixel here, and, you know, even though there's motion, the, the pixel stays white for quite a long time, and so you're still going to blend all these white pixels together, and get a denoise version of that, and so that, that, when you don't have any texture, that would look smooth over time. Um, the only place where you will have a bit of noise is when you have a textured object that is moving, because then, for that particular location, um, the, because it moves, um, it always be different from the previous image, and therefore, the, um, you, you won't do any, 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 any averaging. All right, so, I mean, obviously we know that to use motion estimation will be good, but what's interesting here is the idea that there are ways of um, dealing with motion even so you don't know what the motion is, okay? Uh, which kind of comes back to what I, I told you um, uh, Monday, um, well, that the, well, last time, that the um, motion estimation will fail, so you can't really rely 100% of on, on, on the motion vectors you have. So you need to have a, a whole bunch of mechanisms to account for that. And, and the good news here that there are ways, you know, by looking carefully at what's going on, the frame difference and so on, to actually make sure that uh, you can switch off your processing or your effect at regions where you think there might be a problem, okay? So here we say, if between this, I'm going to average in time at the same pixel location, but I say there might be a problem if there is motion and motion will happen, you know, I will be able to detect motion somehow because I'll be able to spot a difference of the DFD in time. So therefore, I will check for that. And if that happens, then I switch off my, uh, my processing. Right. Um, so, okay, so here comes motion composited um, version. So, this is the one we really want. So you have the denoise version, which is uh, so moving, uh, so IR filter based on the motion composited pixel this time. So this time the difference is we, we add this, uh, we know the displacement, and so we're going to fetch the correct pixel, and we're going to read what the value uh, of the predicted denoise pixel is, all right? So the same equation, but this time we have this D. Uh, but we're still going to use, we can still use, as was always a good idea, to have still a mechanism in place to make sure that what you're doing makes sense, okay? And as I said, um, motion estimation will fail, we know that, so it's good to have something here to keep that, uh, to check for that. So this is what we have, you have the same alpha, and um, this is the, uh, so the original noisy image, and this is the uh, motion composited uh, prediction. But we're still going to check for that because we don't trust our motion estimator. Okay, so you still need something that will kind of say, right, um, these differences may be higher than you think, or they might be an issue. All right, so same story here. Um, do you, you know, alpha, you can come from different, you know, function, the uh, function of the DFD. Um, but anyway, this is, this is what you get. Um, that's any different from what we had before? I don't know, very hard to see uh, what you observe, okay? You will note something though, um, and that's an effect of motion estimation, of poor motion estimation. Um, so the playback is not smooth for some reason. Um, if you look here, uh, the motion up is not as smooth as it should be, and it's kind of a Very subtle, um, but it feels like it's the, the whole calendar is not moving as one, but somehow the blocks are kind of moving slightly differently. Okay, so like the the region instead of moving smoothly at just one block, um, um, it, it doesn't seem so. Uh, it seems to move kind of in. Yeah, it's yeah, it's impossible to see. 
The problem you have with motion estimation here is that the, we use the motion estimation which is based on a pixel level. So the, the accuracy we get is a displacement uh, um, that is accurate to a pixel. Um, but that is not correct. We know we should have you know, sub-pixel displacement. So that, uh, you would see some artifacts happening here because you're, when you fetch the data, the data is actually not the correct one. It's slightly offset. Um, the second point is each block will fetch, will, ha will have its own motion vectors. And if for some reason not all motion vectors point to the same direction, then you will have a slightly different processing in place in different parts of the object. Okay? I know the video is not very convincing here, but um, uh, it's something to keep in mind because now you, d you divide your, your pictures into block. Each pixel will have uh, maybe a slightly different uh, um, set of operations done to it than um, the, next, the, the pixel uh, next to it. And that's because uh, you have this intermediate step, which is the motion estimation, which might be incorrect. Okay, so the, the motion vectors you get for each block might be slightly wrong, and they all contribute to being wrong. Anyway, um, so still the error is less, okay? So uh, on the x-axis you have the frame number, so you have 100 frames. On the y-axis you have the mean absolute error between the original non-noisy uh, uh, sequence and the noisy sequence. And so you see on the top, you have the, uh, the no, sorry, the red one is a noisy sequence. So you have a, a, a mean absolute error of 15 across the range. Um, the non-motion composite denoising is very bad. Remember, that's the one where you start to have a massive blur happening because you average over the entire shot, so um, the error becomes very bad. Okay, so this one. Uh, as soon as we start to use, um, so that's the one with uh, adaptative alpha. So we're trying to look at the difference in time to detect whether there might be motion or not, but we still don't motion compensate. We just, uh, at least we are motion aware. Okay, so I'll say that we are motion aware. Uh, so we're doing better. And here, and this is a motion composite version, and, and which is constantly, consistently better. Okay. Right, so two things to remember, okay, so motion compensation, so using motion vector is very important, okay, so just looking at denoising, that's absolutely essential. Um, but you need to account for the fact that your motion might be incorrect, and so you need to have mechanisms in place to deal with that. Okay, here's uh, another um, example. So, a classic problem of frame rate conversion. Okay, so you, your device maybe requires, well, the, 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 all right, these are all examples. The most modern example would be for you um, the advent of, um, so, um, a, a high, high definition screens, okay? So you have TV set at home, it's quite big, and uh, you're, you're in HD or, or 4K. And but really, it was recorded maybe at 25 frames per second. All right? And in the first generation of a, uh, HDTV, the, the motion was very poor. You would see uh, kind of jerky motions uh, because basically you have um, a very large area and you have an object that might move quite quickly across that area. And because you sample at 25 frames per second, you will actually see your, your eyes will actually see uh, the stop motion of that. So we see this, and after this, 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 and this, okay? And so what people found is like when you move to the old standard definition, small TV set to HD, that you the idea was, okay, before 25 frames per second, your eyes will be fooled by that. You know, you have a, a persistence, um, or, and, and, your, and your eyes cannot you know, perceive the motion, okay? Uh, but we start, that's not true anymore if you increase the resolution on, on the size of your display. Then you can start to see that. Um, and then, so that was a problem. So the way uh, the TV 
manufacturers they, 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 what they've done, um, I think Philip, Philips was one of the first one to do that, um, they, they started to have motion estimation built in in their TV sets. So they will actually, on the fly, compute the motion vectors on your, between your frames, and they will sensitize, based on this motion, a number of frames in between frames. Okay, so we'll see how that works. Uh, but basically, they were able to bump up from 20 frames per second to maybe 400 frames per second nowadays. Okay, so when you see 400 hertz or 200 hertz or whatever on the TV set, what it means is that they're able to go from the 25 frames per second you should have, they, they actually get from the, uh, the satellite um, uh, connection, uh, they actually bump that number up to 400 frames per second or so. Okay, and then what happens because they're able to interpolate the motion to create more in between frames, the motion looks smoother and you have less of this um, uh, um, you know, staggered uh, uh, perception. So something like very practical that is done on every single TV screen you can find nowadays, okay? So how does it work? Uh, so, okay, so that's the idea, so you have, um, say on, so on top you have four frames and now you want to um, say multiply by Not very clear here. Um, you <laughs> you want to multiply by some number? Uh, oh yeah, no, that's for uh, three to pull down. Okay, well that's fine. Um, but anyway, you want to increase the. Do you want to generate more frames from what you had before? Okay. And that's the idea. Um, uh, uh, the basic idea. Okay, the the whole thing is quite complicated. Um, but that's the basic idea of it, and that's. By the way, what was behind the matrix effect, the slow motion effect, okay? So, you have here, your one and three are your two consecutive frames, okay? So say you want to go from 25 to 50 frames per second. Um, so one and three are the actual frames you have. So remember the, the frame is contracted or you see just from the, from the side, all right? The background that is not moving is the black one and the, the blue thing is, uh, it's an object, so a uh, person, and that is, or car, or whatever, that is moving, uh, but it's moving a different direction from the background. And you want to reconstruct this frame here, okay? And the way you're going to do that is you're going to say, you know, what is the motion at a particular point? And you're trying to pull that information, um, the corresponding pixel, along the motion uh, trajectories. The problem, of course, you have is, the frame here, there's two things missing, okay? So first, you don't have the pixels, and the second thing, you don't have the motion vectors, okay? So that's kind of a lot of things missing here. Um, so the, the first step you want to do, maybe, is to look at the motion and try to get something from the motion. So um, you don't have, although you don't have the motion, uh, what you can make is the assumption that the motion will be going straight across, okay? So um, that if an object is visible here, it will be visible here as well, and um, that direction, that motion, uh, will go through that frame uh, it interrupted. Okay, so you have a, a straight line uh, continuation here. Um, which means that um, you could try to find the, so the way you do the motion estimation now here, for that frame, missing frame, is slightly different from the way it went on before, okay? So what we say here is like for a given pixel x, okay, for this location, so we have a block around that. Now we don't have any, we don't have any, um, we don't have that block. We don't know what that block is. But what we could do is to say, we could try different directions. We could say, you know, I'll try this direction and I'll take a block here and a block in the frame three and one and test that direction as a candidate direction. I say, you know, is that a possible direction? And then I have two block coordinates, one in uh, frame one and one in frame three, and I can compare them, all right? So this is how I do it. So I have this, if you want, I use the point I'm looking at as a pivot, and I have, um, I will try different motion vectors that will go through that point, that middle point. And I will have, that will define a location in the, or the an originating location in frame one 
and a destination in frame three, and I've defined for me two blocks that will compare against each other. Um, this is how it's defined, right? So, um, all right. The, the motion equation if you want, looks like that. So you have the middle frame, the one you want to reconstruct is frame n. This is frame n minus one and n plus one. So we said that the pixel value at coordinate x in frame n, so i n of x, but we don't know what it is, okay? We have no clue. Uh, we say that's equal to uh, this pixel location at co coordinate x plus the motion vector of to go from n to n, to, to go back from n to n minus one. And that's equal to the pixel location in the next frame, but this time going the other way, right? And because we assume somehow that uh, the motion vector goes along, you know, goes uninterrupted, we have uh, anti-symmetry here um, uh, at this location. All right, so coming back here, at this point here, we know that this motion vector goes this way, and the other one in that other direction will go symmetrically the uh, other direction. Okay, same here, so here, we know that the motion vector, whatever it is, will go one way, uh, to go from two to three, and the exact opposite way to go from two to one. And if you make that assumption, then, although you don't know about this one, you have a direct uh, DFD, if you want, here to compute, because you can compare, you have a location, which is the one you're looking at, you have your candidate vector, you can test, and that defines a block in the previous frame and the block in the next frame, and then you can compare that. So now you have actually a metric, uh, uh, if you want to modify DFD, uh, which is not between the current frame and the next frame, but between the current frame, the, between the next frame and the previous frame, all right? And you never actually look at your current frame. So that's kind of a neat trick uh, you have. So that's the DFD that is defined uh, between the previous frame and the next frame. And because both frames here are defined and known, then you can actually test for that and then you can minimize for it and just use you know, standard techniques you looked at and, and you, you, you get the best motion at that point, okay? And once you have the motion, then you say, well, um, I could reconstruct that and can say my interpolated pixel at this point is uh, you know, maybe a mix between the previous frame and the next frame or so on, right? Does it make sense? Okay, so come back here. Frame rate uh, so frame interpolation, you, you, miss, you don't have anything. You don't have motion, you don't have the picture. But what you can say, you can make an assumption about the motion going straight from frame uh, n minus one to n plus one, and therefore you can define the DFD as be being difference between these two defined frames. And then you can you know, reason about um, possible vectors, motion vectors, and you can minimize for that. And once you minimize for that, you have motion fields, and therefore you have all these red vectors here, okay? So after motion estimation, you get all these red vectors. And, um, and then you can, you know, from the motion vectors, you can try to uh, pull, resensitize the picture in between. Obviously, this is a very simplified view of that because you're missing still a lot of information. Uh, for instance, we don't say, like, this vector here is, um, exist in one direction, but not in, the other, not in the other. So how do you do that? Um, and, you know, and so on and so forth, okay? So what if you have, uh, you know, you, you have motion here, but maybe um, the appearance is slightly different from this pixel to this pixel. You know, here we say we do an average, um, but that probably will blur the picture some, so, somehow, okay? So there's a lot of things that are still need to be reconstructed correctly here. Okay, but that's kind of the gist of it. Um, all right, so probably we stop here um, because next step is about compression. I already made a case. I'll just go tell you a bit on the different various formats that exist. Um, but that was kind of the initial, the, the kickoff lecture. Um, I was making the point for compression. I say like it's literally impossible to, f I say almost impossible to find a camera, video camera, that doesn't compress. Um, you can't get an uncompressed stream from a camera. I think it's impossible, okay? Um, so the first, 
the, 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 historically, the most important compression format, I suppose, is MPEG. Okay? And so it dates back from um, the late 80s and early 90s. And uh, as it turned out, there was kind of two, uh, two standards. There's one MPEG-1. One was formal, like, for, um, for computers, and the one was more for broadcast. And then they merged that uh, into a format called MPEG-2, right? So that's uh, MPEG-2, right? Um, and that kind of included a lot of aspects. So that was designed for, that's when you have in DVDs and in HDTV as well. Uh, but I think in Ireland, actually, it's MPEG-4 straight away. But most of other countries, they still use MPEG-2 and so on. Um, H.264 or MPEG-4, right, um, made some improvement. And, and they, you know, we got quite a lot of um, of improvement from that from MPEG-2. Most of the improvements came from the refinements on the use of motion vectors. Okay, so the heart of all these compression uh, techniques and pegs, uh, they would be JPEG. Okay, so JPEG would be the backbone of it. Uh, so basically, you have a, a JPEG encoding of some keyframes. So a number, of, you know, every every second or so, you have one frame which would be encoded as JPEG. But in between, we use motion vectors to try to propagate that information. And both the differences between all the MPEG versions and how a subtle um, improvements based on how we use the motion vectors, how we code them, and, and, and so on and so forth. The landscape has changed quite a lot. So nowadays, okay, you have H.264, which is a dominant format. But in, uh, in 2010, uh, Google acquired Onto, which had something called the VPX codex. And so nowadays, you have two competing standards. You have MPEG-4, uh, sorry, H.264 and VP9. And these are the two main formats. They're very similar, mainly because um, there's not much you can do about the nature, like the, all this to MPEG and, and Google have tried different ways of going about doing compression. But because of all sorts of external constraints, so which due to hardware and so on, uh, people found out it's very hard to get in difference. Anyway, um, this is very, very light overview. The, the fact that VP9 exists is um, maybe not something you've experienced too much, um, but it makes a big difference in the landscape because if, uh, before everything was held, all the patterns were held by MPEG, so we kind of every, all the innovation was depending on MPEG, and now you have a new player which is open source, and more and more companies are going towards uh, VP9 and uh, the, v, the the, uh, the, the consortium behind it. Right, okay, so we'll see that uh, tomorrow.